everybody. Welcome to the Clear Tai Chi Mastermind meeting for Friday, August 5th, 2022. The topic today is the Ty Talbert um, interview. And before we get going on that, let me introduce everybody. And I'm Richard Cleary, resident host. Uh, this is Matt Holker. He's the regional organizer for uh, Maryville, Tennessee, outside in Knoxville. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Mark Mashad in Michigan. He's going to tell you what parts. Hi, it's the Midwest Michigan area covering Lake Grand Rapids, Lansing, and the area in between. Welcome. Jared Blakesmith in Cleveland, Ohio. Yep, thank you. Uh, I can be found on Emerald Valley Tai Chi on Facebook. And Welcome. I've got a couple classes starting up here in the fall. Yay. Ty Talbert in San Antonio, Texas. Hi, y'all. Well, Hi, y'all. Uh, Barry Leg in Verona, New Jersey, outside of New York City. How you doing? All right. I had to follow up with something. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, New Jersey Tai Chi is the school, Verona, New Jersey, about 15 miles outside of New York City. Um, also have Paul Chansky teaching in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Thank you. And Philip Chan in Columbus, Georgia. Hello, all. Welcome. And Sheila Bell in Costa Rica, and she's going to tell you which parts of Costa Rica. Guanacaste. <laughs> um, just following the uh, trend. I am in Guanacaste, and the classes are in Playa del Coco and in Liberia. Well, yeah, all right. So uh, before we get going any further, uh, I, want, I need to promote to you a little bit, word from our sponsor and all that. Uh, Clear Tai Chi Level 1, we have um, an online curriculum for the Level 1 curriculum, and then from there, um, it goes into, there's an intermediate program. Uh, we found that a lot of people, when they have our Level 1, it really changes their whole, everything they thought they wanted from Tai Chi, they begin to see how you can actually get there. It makes, it makes a real difference. We have DVDs for that also. For, for those things, go to clearmartialarts.com. The other one that I'm wanting to make sure that I promote pretty much, we'll probably say something about this in every one of our meetings from now on is that in June of every year, the first like full weekend in June, um, we have the clear Tai Chi family, international family gathering and um, go to Tai Chi gathering.com and you can see who the teachers are and what kinds of topics they're presenting. And usually it's more than a dozen. In fact, usually it's, it's always been over a dozen. It will continue to be that. And they are in very specific and um, well-informed topics in Tai Chi. And it's a real fun time and a lot of uh, push hands. And we have a Saturday night uh, uh, panel on specific topics that you get to kind of enjoy that entertainment while you eat. And the food is great. I've made sure of it. And that's the Clear Tai Chi International Family Gathering. And it's in the first weekend of June and it's taichigathering.com. To give you some idea, the one in 2022 wrapped up on June 5th. Today's date as we are recording this is August 5th. And we are already just a little bit excited about the 2023 event. So, uh, you know, it's a blast. We have. We have a great time uh, and you should, you should definitely check it out. And if you can make it, join us. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really fun weekend. Um, and again, taichigathering.com. Fun and informative. And informative, yes. All right. Okay. Um, so Ty, if you would state your name and the name of your school. Um, again, my name is Ty Talbert and I'm actually making a transition. Uh, the school was called Warrior Tai Chi, and because of the time I think I'm going to be on the road from now on, I'm transitioning into having a club so that it, I can have a lot of people come together, get additional knowledge about Tai Chi, help each other grow, but I don't have to be there for every single meeting every single week. I am. Okay. Then in, in your in-between times, is it also that you're likely to do something where you do like a six weeks? program or something like that for six weeks or eight weeks so that when you've got people that have the PTSD, because I know you work with a lot of PTSD folks, 
which we'll get into, um, that you'll have one that's just specifically for Tai Chi for them? Yes, I'm, I'm working on that at several of the military bases, uh, that those will actually be a completely separate program. I had programs like that in California where I worked at bases. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go ahead now that COVID's over with, hopefully I'll be able to set something up like that with the military here. Yeah, cool. Good deals. And also joining us is Jim, Jim Kelly in Boca Raton. Uh, uh, I'll skip back to that for a second. In Boca Raton, Florida. Hi, Jim. Yeah. I'm here. Hey, how's it going, <laughs> Sifu? Yeah. We just started interviewing uh, Ty, Jim. Ah, okay. Cool. Just in time. <laughs> um, Ty, tell us your school situation, including satellite classes, et cetera. Well, you just did city, state, mm -hmm. location. And so you're in San Antonio, Texas. Right. Uh, bases, there's how many bases there? Uh, there are six military bases. I'm going to be setting up the club in Converse. And Converse is very unique that there are 30,000 people in the town and 10,000 of them are vets. Okay. Yeah. And is Converse where you live or is Converse nearby? No, Converse is where I live. Um, we're basically two miles from the um, official border of San Antonio. Okay, nice. cool. So it's a nice outskirt. Community. Yes. Cool. Now, for those who don't know, Tai was a very successful Tai Chi teacher with a number of uh, students that are actually, you know, uh, towards towards senior now in our program, um, kind of moving moving up the ladder anyways in skill sets and stuff in California. And he just moved to San Antonio, which is why he's kind of setting up shop, but, uh, but he's very capable and, and making quick work of it, it sounds like. <laughs> cool. Um, how many years have you been studying Tai Chi? I've been studying Tai Chi for eight years. And how many years have you been teaching Tai Chi? Well, I've been teaching Tai Chi for five years. I actually been studying with you for seven years. Okay, cool. Um, and then, And then um, what martial arts have you studied and what is your teaching experience and journey? Okay. I know there's a few that you've got a bit there. All right. You kind of skipped <laughs> over a few things. Out uh, did, I skip, did I skip some things? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> what did I skip? Uh, usually the next thing you had was the elaborate on your background. Yeah. So, that's, you know, okay. Yeah. Um, it started with that. I'm going to. That is, it's elaborate on your background and then what martial arts have you studied and what is your teaching experience? Journey. Okay. Um, personally, um, who I am is that I'm fifth generation military. I'm a Navy brat and I grew up around the world, including Europe, Japan, and Australia. And then while in the Marine Corps, I spent four years in Japan and three years in South America and Central America. And I have a total of five combat tours. I spent my first 12 years in recon. And then the Marine Corps wanted public affairs people who had a combat background. So they sent me to school and then I became a photojournalist for special ops units. Okay. And then on my last tour, um, after having getting additional training, I was put in charge of a $3 million budget for marketing and advertising for the Marine Corps recruiting in the Los Angeles area. Um, after leaving the Marine Corps, I worked in security in Yemen, Kazakhstan, and Chechnya. And then I did security for celebrities in Los Angeles. Okay. Um, part of the reason why I have been able to have those sort of jobs is that I have studied Tang Sido, which is where I got my first black belt, Fu Jiao Pai, Black Tiger Kung Fu, Ninpo, and of course, Tai Chi. And I started teaching martial arts in the Marine Corps. So I taught martial arts in the Marine Corps for 18 years. Was that more like you were holding classes of a sort or was it that you were actually a, a like a Marine Corps combat instructor? Of, of... Oh, um, th there are basically three classifications of instructors in the Marine Corps. And then there are people who have the, the MOS as close quarter combat instructors. And they're usually either in boot camp or they're in infantry school. Yeah. But then units would have their own instructor 
to teach whatever program the Marine Corps has at the time. And that was the level that I was at. I was officially an instructor for the Marine Corps, um, but a unit instructor. Okay. And yeah. so I was instructor for 2nd Battalion Recon, 3rd Battalion Recon, and the Deep Reconnaissance Platoon. Mm -hmm. And then I was an instructor for a unit called the 32nd Marine Expeditionary Unit. It's a special operations unit. And then I've you know done some other teaching for other units while I was in the Marine Corps over 18 years. Yeah, cool. Um, and it's, let's see here. And then what? Uh, so then I've got here. What other credentials do you have? And some of that is the specific listings of like the clear Tai Chi stuff that you have and that you're certified for and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And there's I know there's a couple of other things in there. Yeah, um, well, I'm certified as a, a clear Tai Chi level one instructor. I have clear internal push hands level two instructor, um, Falgang healing practitioner level four. And then I have some additional credentials from Anthony Ho, Shin Lee, uh, Jack Hoban, Kevin Mills, and Hatsumi. Oh, yeah. Cool. And then you're a certified peer to peer counselor? Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'm a certified peer to peer counselor. It's something that happened. After I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, the county of Riverside County had a program where they wanted outreach for vets with PTSD. And so I went through their three month program to become a certified peer to peer counselor. And you work under uh, either a social worker or a psychologist working with vets. Yeah, and it's, 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 if I get this right, it's that they've decided that somebody that's actually been there and done that is going to be a lot better able to relate and to, and, to, and to help than somebody that's just got their book learning but hadn't really experienced any of that. So they can't, they can't relate. Even if they know this is the process of how we, do, how we work with that, it's different knowing what is going on with the person. Yeah, it's almost sort of a, a recon job in that, I went out and did outreach to um, homeless vets. And usually I would know where to find them. I would know whether the person was actually a vet um, because they would tell you, oh yeah, um, can, you know, can you give me this and give me that, give me that. I was, I was a pilot in the, in the army special ops. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> you know, they come up with a lot of different stories, a lot of the homeless people. And then also I, will understand what would motivate them to go ahead and become involved in different programs with the county and what they were willing to accept, what they weren't willing to accept and who they were willing to deal with. And so I, between what was going on in the county and homeless vets, I was that guy. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Is that something you think you'll do some of where you're at in San Antonio or <clears throat> not, not as likely? I will do it, but I won't do it under the auspices of a government entity. I might do it with nonprofits. In fact, sure. uh, before I left California, the things I was doing, I was doing with nonprofits that I believed in because yeah. I found that um, some organizations are looking at this is a way for us to get money. We can, we can use vets so that we can drive a really nice car, sure. have a three thousand dollar chair um go to you know Keep seminars talking. in hawaii but we don't actually spend any money on the vets right yep yep i'm hearing you yeah, so you're able to vet your nonprofits and make sure it's one where the money goes to what it's supposed to go to yes yeah exactly cool man <laughs> um do you have any notable teaching accomplishments in terms of like who you've taught? I think if it's, if, yeah, you got here listed all that kind of Marine stuff. So if it's one you already said, just say, just, you know, put it across. You already covered that. If any of these are different then because it looks like it's the same one you kind of said already. Yeah. You know, I, I realized too, um, after I, you know, basically started working on this, that something I hadn't mentioned and what I'd done is working in the gyms and the community centers on mm -hmm. bases but I've taught in the gyms and community centers at March Air Force Base, um, Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base, and the Miramar Naval Air Station. Okay. And that's the sort of work that I want to do here also. 
because we have six bases here in San Antonio. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, so those are notable teaching accomplishments. Is there anything there that I'll ask you a question that's not really here that maybe we'll end up getting back into some, but for any of that, is there anything that stands out to you as a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a spe any specific moments or, or things that happened? Um, ideally not bad, but it could be that something really went haywire and that you ended up having to do some things or something that was like a really enriching, empowering, um, memorable, maybe heart, you know, heart touching or what, but anyway, something memorable in terms of like out of that, anything that really stands out to you. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a couple of things again. Um, I guess Jim kind of made me remember about this is that I had a student that um, was going through the Riverside Sheriff's Academy and he was showing me all the different things that he was learning at the Sheriff's Academy. And he said, oh yeah, I'll show you this takedown. I said, well, if you do it like that, I'm gonna end up kicking you in the head and possibly knocking you out. And he's like, no way. So he went to go ahead and do the takedown and I rolled out of it and kicked him in the head. And he's like, what did I do wrong? This is how they taught us. I was like, they taught you that, but you didn't keep your structure. You were bent over while you were doing this. It's easy for me to take your balance and roll out of it. And um, so he told the instructor at the academy and the academy had me come in, in and do some adjustments on how they were doing things, how to do it without strength and do it with good structure. Cool, man. Yeah. Didn't become a full-time instructor there, but hey, got the point across. The, uh, I did a self-defense program um, through a team that I had trained to go do this at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And ideally it would have been me actually doing the, the training and they loved the training, but they wanted other training. And then that team was specifically taught for the program they got. And otherwise there's a good chance I would have been teaching starting about 20 years ago at the Air Force Academy there in, uh, in Colorado Springs. Well, the, the problem that happens, you probably would not still be teaching there because what happened with me is that quite often a new colonel or a new general will come in and he's like, oh, I like the SCAR program or I like and change everything. Uh, yeah. yeah, and so we're going to put my stamp on it and change the entire system. And yeah. that usually happened to me about every four years while I was in the Marine Corps. Wow. So we taught the instructors that were the combat instructors there at the academy. And yes. so if they, so part of what I'm hearing you say is that you, not only would it have been that I would have done that for a longer term thing, but that those combat instructors, when somebody new comes in, they either learn the new regiment or they're just replaced with other people that are now doing this other thing right on the spot. Well, that job in the, the military, okay, whether it was at my level or the level at one of the academies or boot camp is not a full-time job. It's what's called a secondary job. I got you. So you'll find out that for the most part, um, in the Marine Corps, the guys are infantry. And the Air Force, they're what are called, um, I forgot what, the, but they're the pararescue guys. Pararescue yeah. guys. Yeah. yeah, the pararescue guys are usually the guys who teach that sort of thing in the Air Force. Yeah. But they all spend four years doing it or so, three years, well, actually two to three years, and then they move back to the real job. Otherwise, they'll never get promoted. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, so you've taught in a number of different places too. Where all have you taught? Um, geographically, um, I've taught in New Jersey, North Carolina, and then outside of the U.S., I've taught in Okinawa, Japan, Brazil, and Colombia. And you taught a class here in Tennessee? <laughs> yes. At our, at our yearly... Uh, at our yearly yes. Right I'll, I'll make sure I add yeah. Tennessee. <laughs> it's to me you taught it in California somewhere once. <laughs> you said California. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, missed it. oh, okay. Yeah. All the few places there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the um, so I've got here the normal question I kind of ask at this point has to do with specific student or students success or successes and that can be with health or self-defense um, or both mm -hmm. um, I don't want to let you talk about that okay now you've got some so yeah I've, I've got quite a few but um, I want to emphasize that my goal has always been to help vets and to use Tai Chi to bring them away from the edge. Um, I've had several vets who've been able to socialize, you know, deal with depression, rage, anxiety, things that I had to deal with myself. And that anxiety, rage was my problem. Um, recently, um, when I was leaving California, I found out that I had an impact beyond my students because one of my students told me that when he told his wife I was leaving, she started crying, started bawling. And I'm like, what was that about? I mean, I, I'd spoken to his wife maybe one time and he said, well, she knew the, what kind of changes you made in my life. Right. And that's why she was upset that you were leaving. Yeah. Yeah. Man. What caused you to start studying from Seagull for me? <clears throat> well, I thought that Clear Tai Chi was the most legitimate and comprehensive program that I could find. Um, and I was looking for a legitimate program because I had to have some sort of paper to show the VA for me to work with the people sure. in the VA. Yeah. And I had gone to seminars with Meisner and uh, Rasmus, William C. C. Chung, um, and several other people um, that you may or may not know of. And what I found was that your seminar was impressive, not only because of the, the material it taught, but it, how it was taught and the students you had because I, I would go and I'd see some people who had students that were with them for 20 years. And I'm like, they've got nothing. And then I'd look at your students. And I'm like, huh, okay. You know, they're getting something there. Also, I love the fact that you always have a way to test the validity of whether or not you're getting the material that's taught. And at this one specific um, workshop, the one in Virginia, I said, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. You lined everybody up, you scanned them, and then you dealt with their um, issues without them even telling you what their issues were. And I'm like, I was amazed. What kind of issues, out of curiosity? <clears throat> um, and if I'm sounding like, well, how come I don't remember that? It's because <laughs> I'm teaching most days, and the, the thing he's talking about happened five years ago. <laughs> okay. Give or take. I, I, at the time, was dealing with prostate cancer and I was having a great deal of problems. So physical in, issues. Yes. So physical issues, yeah. In my um, left hip. Okay. Um, where I could barely stand up. Yeah. And you worked on it and boom, pain has not returned since. Yep. And that's, you're talking about I used the fog gun without touching you to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. That's when I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, I found my martial arts home. <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you. Um, so what is your favorite thing to study or learn and why? Okay. Um, anything internal. I have done a lot, studied martial arts most of my life. Um, you know, my first black belt at 14 years old. And that's what makes Tai Chi special to me is the internal. And when I say the internal, I'm talking about whether it's the internal as far as myself personally, dealing with self-defense, dealing with healing other people, all of the internal parts of Tai Chi. That's what really gets me jazzed. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And that's your favorite, and then, is, and then what's your favorite, and I, and I know you're going to kind of say the same thing, so we're going to try to get some dimension to this, 
the internal. What's your favorite thing to teach? Uh, yeah, about what is your favorite thing to teach about the internal? Or when you're working with people, what is it that really stands out to you, or that you're like, man, this is like cool, or I like it, or it's I could do this all day, or you know, whatever. Well, you know, the thing is, is that um, what internal thing can I find to connect to the person? If um, the person is really involved in self defense and that sort of thing, and then I can show them how the internal can be used. Um, then I, that's a way for me to connect with them. If the person has problems with um, pain and I can go ahead and relieve that pain, usually I can if it's superficial pain, um, then that's a great, great way to connect. Um, another way that I found to connect with um, Yang people is that if they have studied root and they have root, and then I can just cut their root off or play with their root, and they're like, oh, there's something more here. And so I like being able to take my internal things and find out how can I connect with that student with something internal. Yep. Cool. I've, one of the things that, I've, that comes up or that I've seen things on even recently talked about online is that you know, for a lot of people with Tai Chi, uh, they go, okay, there's this internal thing. You get somebody that's only done Tai Chi and they've done Tai Chi for 20 years and they get up with somebody who's an ex just a real external, but maybe they're a Thai boxer or they're a grappler, whether it be Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or something else. And they, they play and the Tai Chi person, as long as they're playing pretty nice, can do some things. And as soon as they kind of get like, let's put a hold on here or let's punch you in the head, they have problems. And... And the solution to that I found, like people that have the background, like what you've got, they don't seem to have that problem because you know how to put a lock on 20 different ways. You know how to put them in an arm bar a bunch of different ways. You know how to get them in a headlock. You know how to throw them. You know how to punch somebody. You know how to take a punch. And I'm talking about without bringing the internal into it yet. Right. And then you add the internal understanding with that so that it becomes its internal but there's nothing about the contact and the positioning that is strange to you or, or really unusual to you because then the person's mind to be able to do that internally, they've got to have it without resistance, but you can't bring in somebody off the street and they're in their first three month, you know, beginning classes anywhere from first week to almost a year, even most of the time and put them in that kind of a scenario and have them be okay. Cause they're not going to be, you know, it's either you're going to be teaching them self-defense and then when does and then we haven't started Tai Chi yet. Mm -hmm. And that way you get some idea about what contact and positioning for contact and different kinds of contact are. Or you're going to have to basically start teaching them about if they don't have any kind of skill already, things that make contact. Push hands is a is one element that helps with that, but it's not the whole thing by a shot. And then you go, okay, now that we've done that, let's add that internal in there and make it what it really is for Tai Chi. And so it's, it's one of the reasons that I think that a lot of people don't have the Tai Chi at a higher level is because the learning, the amount of learning there is like double or triple most other martial arts. Because you got to learn all this other stuff that we were just talking about, I was just talking about in terms of placement and doing things. And now I need to make that internal. And what happens if they skip that step First time somebody punches them in the head, their mind's all like this. They're, the internal went out the window. Not that they didn't have it. They just can't use it right now. And for those of you that have had, like, the experience that you've got, or, or, and obviously that you've got, like, tons of that kind of experience, but, but for somebody who's got at least some experience that way, that this is not outside of something that is beyond their understanding, Right, as long as it's within your, you've, you've had some of this, done some of this, or do some of this, then it's not so hard to put the internal into that, work on your internal and get it all going on. Somebody without that other understanding, they're trying to do all the soft things and the internal things, but they really don't get the rest of the dynamic. And it creates, it creates a, 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 a difference there that is hard to surmount for the average person. You know, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot you got to put a lot more into it that where are you even getting the information and the understanding to do it? Anyways, I'm going to let you speak to that some because I can tell you. Want to. No, I, I don't know if I got this from you or something I came up with my myself, but 
usually when I talk to my students, I talk to them about an algorithm, okay? And in that algorithm, we'll put in technique, we'll put in strength, speed, um, endurance, and the internals. And so if somebody ranks a one on everything and has a 20 on internals, and they're going with somebody who has an algorithm where they've got a 20 on everything and a zero on internal, they're going to get beat. Yeah, you're now, saying the person that's got the 20 on everything else and not yes. the internal is going to beat. It has no internal. has high internal, but doesn't have the rest. Yes. Yeah, because they they understand something about application and the person has got the internal. They can do internal under real ideal laboratory, school, classroom mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. They just don't really have the understanding of applying it. Yeah. So I, I tell them, you know, you've got to work on these other things. You've got to have some physical strength. You've got to learn technique. You've got to learn all these other things. And then the internal is a force multiplier. Don't think that it's a magical thing that works separately all by itself. You know, so. It trumps everything else. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And when there's a lot of people selling that and then you get tested on it and it doesn't work out like that. Yeah, exactly. And it's not that you have to go and become a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt and a Muay Thai black belt and a pro boxer and a half a dozen other things. You don't even need to be a certified black belt in any of it. But you got to know if you're going to do things that involve contact, you got to have some understanding of real understanding of contact and right. build it up, which is how it's done in the Tai Chi for, for what the programs really are. It's not like, bam, how that feel to you. You know, uh, 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 now do your intern. You know, it's not that, but it is, you know, here's it goes from being just in just the push hands to deal with the pushes, deal with the pushes, deal with the pushes, and on the head and on the body, and then it and then building up and still making all of your stuff work because it does, but not without training it, it doesn't exactly. So cool. Did you, did you have more to add on no, that? No, no, that's exactly no what I, I quite often have to emphasize to um, the students that are just getting into martial arts and they think that, okay, well, I'll have the internal from Tai Chi and that's that's what I need. I'm like, no. Yeah, learn your, you know, I'm not saying do the form again and again and again and again and again and eventually things will show up because that doesn't work either. Yes. And that's even worse. That is somebody who thinks the internal is going to solve everything. But do your form, understand the positions and what those, like, get 10 applications for each of those moves because there's, like, 75 or more. Mm -hmm. And do, how does that move deal with the punch? How, a, different, a couple different kinds of punches or several. How does it deal with a kick if it does? How does it deal with somebody grabbing you at the arm, on your body, trying to tackle you? Because all the, most of the moves, they'll have – you know, especially if it's like low moves, well, it's not covering for punches to the head. If it's a high move, it's not covering for punches to the, for kicks to the groin. But in the, any decent Tai Chi set, you've covered all the space around you multiple times in multiple ways for every kind of contingency that could possibly happen in terms of a physical altercation between two people. And if you know 10 decent, reasonably decent applications, for each move, you've covered the basis of what that can get into. And if you know that for your form, now you probably actually know your form, or at least you know a certain to a certain level of real understanding. And now when you go now, put the internal into that. Because a lot of those applications, it's not that you weren't internal or soft, it's that, and ideally you were, it's that you were really dealing with incoming force of some kind. And if you're not dealing with incoming force, well, then you're then that's where the reality leaves the room because the person in the street who's trying to punch you in the head is trying to bring force to you. Well, I've, so, I've come yeah, across but, so many Tai Chi schools where it's not even a matter of dealing with incoming force. They do the form and they do several forms over and over again. Um, a school here, I won't name the school, is considered the best Tai Chi school in San Antonio. And I went there and the senior student was showing me around and he was a third degree black belt in Tai Chi. And he was- Yeah, there's no such thing. It's, uh, it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, there's no such thing. Well, I mean, there is in their style or their way of putting it. Yes, yes but the, it's not their, their program. 
And that ranks are a Japanese or Okinawan thing, and Tai Chi is Tai, tai Chi Chuen is Chinese. So yeah, yes. But there were um, three of us that were there to to check out the school, and so he's showing us the basics of a form, and um, he showed part the wild horse's mane. He says, and this is how this is used. And I'm like, and so what other ways do you guys use it? He goes, no, this is the one way it's used. And I'm like, oh, yeah. see ya. <laughs> and I've come across a couple of schools like that. Yeah, where they've got one application and somewhere along the way, they, they, their understanding became, well, it's that one thing. It does that one thing. And Why else would you have to learn 108 moves? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, do you have something that you find yourself? I've got what is your favorite thing to practice? I know that that at this point in time is internal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah actually, so no, it's not. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's really weird in that. Um, yeah. I looked at the, the different stages of Tai Chi. And one of the stages is Lee. And I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm overweight. So I've been losing about 0.8 pounds per day. Um, I'm going to physical therapy twice a day, twice a week. They've got me what's on an unloader brace to reshape my kneecap. They're going to be putting in um, cartilage in my kneecap. They've got me on different supplements. They're saying that it's a 50 50 chance that everything they've got me doing, I won't need knee surgery in six months. If I cool. stick with it for a year, that there's a 95% chance I won't need knee surgery because okay. they're basically using other method methods to go yeah, ahead and reshape me, my knee. How are you and, feeling about it so far? Um, it's, it's very, very strange. Um, like the first day I put on the knee brace, um that night my knee popped like three times woke me up and it's like whoa but then i didn't have any pain and i'm like oh okay yeah, it's the adjustment the way they did it's adjustment i'd like to know um i don't want to talk about it too much on the call a little bit more mm -hmm. is good uh but i'd like to know more about that because this is obviously something that's pretty new yes it is and so what i'm doing is it's like okay i love the internal but right now my physicality is not where it needs to be. And so it is probably getting 75% of my time. I'm riding the bike and I'm going to gym and lifting weights and doing physical therapy and, and all those sort of things. Yeah. Yep. The, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the internal. I love the internal. I do lots of internal things every day. I mm -hmm. put hands on somebody 90% of the time I'm doing internal stuff um with them to them and that's both on receiving and giving side at the same time um you know train plenty of external martial arts train the form so that i can use them in very external kinds of ways as well as the internal and i like the, the thing that my teacher uncle bill has to say about it which is when he's asked about internal and, and all and external and all that stuff he's he's like he's like and they're asking about his system. He's like, internal, external, external, internal. And they're like, which one is it? It's both. Yes. They don't exist independently. It's both. For him, it's always internal, external. And when I was younger, you know, I've been with him for 20, since 1994, since I first met him. So coming up on, coming up on 30 years, right? And just being with him and the other teachers and stuff. But for him specifically, and when I first met him and I heard that the first time, and I don't know that I heard it the first time I met him, but sometime in that first year or two, I heard this said. And I knew he was doing it. I could see it and feel it. He's doing internal stuff like crazy all the time, right? And at the time he, when I met him, so he's 85 now. Um, and so 28 years ago, he was... 57 and at the time and, and then you know by the time i heard it he probably he was 60 already and so i'm like internal external what's he talking about of course i was you know a 30 year old man at that point right 30 31 and 58 now 
And I was like, so why would this old guy be saying that? You'd think he'd be all about internal and be like headed really that much more into the internal. Well, when I hit 50, I, I did a self check and I went to doctors and got like all the kind of, you know, that extra, extra real serious takes three days kind of a physical. I wanted it from top to bottom. And what I figured out about myself was, is that I was beginning to lose physical strength in a noticeable way. Mm -hmm. And I went and started training the crap out of that and went from not being able to do one pull up, full pull up, or being able to do one and then ending up as I was trying to do more. And some of it was bad form, but a lot of it was just the strength that I had and did not have. And pulled my arm out of socket probably three different times and had to let it heal up each time and some other odd and end stuff. And so then I trained it up so that now I can do the bar where I come up here and I pull the bar and I set it on my chest and back down and I can hit about 10 to 12 of those, give it a minute and then come back and do another half dozen of them. And that changed. I, mean, I don't know that there's ever been a time in my life where I could do that many. And then the push-ups, I've always done the fingertip and then I've done a fair amount on the fist and some other odd and end different kind of ways. And I started really working extra on the ability to do that and to be soft and be able to transmit internal through it, which I've had that ability since I was in my 20s anyways. But then really making sure that that extra physical thing, this is my point here, was in there and that I was doing it. And I began to understand what uncle meant by internal, external. Yes. And so did some of his students, by the way, as he put hands on us and we found a new sensation as we were flying through the air and so one again of the, working that algorithm yeah well yeah. so it's a big myth i think of a certain kind in the internal arts and tai chi specifically where it's no external do not do any external training and all that but anybody that does that and doesn't do things that are going to build the musculature and keep, and really work on the skeleton even if it's just so if i'm standing up and i root you mentioned rooting before and i sink and i'm putting that pressure through the body Yes, it's happening internally, and yet I'm still physically dropping and maneuvering that weight downward in order to get the pressures that are building that bone structure as long as all of your mechanics are correct and you don't have a physical issue, of, you know, a, a, a problem of some kind. And with Uncle, he would do stuff like you're talking about, get on a treadmill and do stuff and different kinds of things. And he's still looking really good and jumping around and quick and powerful at 85. And if, That's my goal. Now, and if you ask him now, which one is it? Internal or external? It's internal, external. It's both. So you're on the right path there as long as you're being smart about it like that. And mm. don't neglect the internal for that external. And exactly. the biggest thing that I think was meant that, that in terms of real application and using it is that you don't want to do so much external that you end up stiff. And then some of that goes to how you train. If I'm doing pull-ups, I'm going from full as much as I can out there all the way to setting that bar on my chest, pulled in and back up. Yeah. And I don't do them where it's like this business where I'm going to be block man because I can't, my, the internal won't run through that either at all, or at least not very well. Mm -hmm. But I do that. And then when I, before I get on it, I stretch like really, really, really stretch. And then when I get off of it, I stretch again. No, I, I've actually, and this is again, because of age that when I was younger, I was just, okay, go into the gym, maybe two hours a day and lift heavy weights and never did more than a 10 minutes with the stretching. Right. Now and my I stretch will block you up and stop. Yeah. That, you know, now my stretching is equivalent or more so than by working with weights. Yep. And I'm careful about the stretches to make sure because it's a lot, it's easy to do something like, let's say you're doing this and going, okay, I'm stretching. Well, you're stretching parts, but there are other parts you're not stretching. So mm -hmm. just like if you did one kind of an exercise, whatever that would be, and went, okay, I'm good for everything. It's like, no, there's a whole bunch of muscles you didn't do anything with, or you did so little that they're not getting improvement. You're going to need a regimen of exercises. You also need a regimen of uh, a regimen might be the wrong word here, a number of stretches because you've got to catch the whole thing. Right. You don't want a part that's not getting that because it will start to do things to you that you don't want it to do to you. Uh, I, I specifically am looking forward to seeing Harry again, the push, because there's an area of my back that he would always attack. And I'm like, am I not? 
relaxed or what's going on there? And the physical therapist said, you've got to work this area of your back. There is no muscular chair no. there whatsoever. He re even referred to it as being empty. Wow. And I'm like, empty in that oh, bad way. Not yes, way. Yeah. exactly. There's a hole in it. Yes. yes. And Did so they show now, you good exercises for that part of your back? Yes. And he said, whatever workout you do, this exercise for that part of your back will be done. Whether you're working a leg day or an upper body day, you always end the workout with this exercise. What'd they show you? Well, is it mid back or is it low back? It's up, it's upper back, right upper between back. Uh, right between the shoulder blades and a little bit higher. Yep. Harry, Harry knows exactly where it is. <laughs> 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 but it's a, a face pull where you pull the weight to your face and back to your ears and then you lift it up and then it works your lats and then it goes all the way down yes yep almost it's, like but the, the, butterfly. But the thumbs have got to go back further than the elbows faster than the elbows you've got the elbows back thumbs have got to go back yes oh, oh, I see. oh feels different doesn't it yeah say it again Thumbs back. I, I was pulling my elbows yes. back. And it's that the thumbs go back past the elbows. Yes. Okay, I get you. Mm -hmm. The uh, the one that I do on the bar right there, all the way up through, I get it. The whole it, it actually, what I find is I come up to the level of bars. I'm not doing them like boom, 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 fast. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the time. I, you know, I'm not going like crazy slow, but I'm I'm moving through. It actually catches all of it. It, mm -hmm. it will move through the different pieces depending on where you're at. Right. Push up you'll get only a couple parts if you're pumping them. But if you'll go slow, and it doesn't have to be crazy slow, but it's, you know, it's this and up, you'll find that it will move in you where it's affecting. Yeah, I've been told on uh, my movements, five seconds positive and five seconds negative. That's it. That's, no, the, kind of, that's the kind of time I'm talking about. And then, mm -hmm. well, time under work. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Preferably work, not tension. If you yes. The, uh, and if you're getting too much tension there, then that's then you have to do a modified version of the ideally, you're gonna do a modified version of the exercise so that you don't get just a bunch of tension in the area, but that you're at a level of work that then will graduate up. Well, and that's the beauty of keeping it smooth too. If you can do it slow and smooth, yeah. And it's mm. not like Arr. so. Arr. So the <laughs> other question then is that they then show you stretching. To get the whole range like that as well or is the yes. stretch in the exercise the, the stretch the is also in the exercise yes. same thing and that's the best if yes. you can get it. but then you still want to stretch for tai chi purposes you're still going to, want to stretch before and after where it's not stressing the muscle in terms of work and load mm -hmm. that it is just stretching yeah I, I try to make sure that i'm working on like the fascia in that area especially yes and so that's uh that's part of what i would ask them about that you know you're familiar with the teacups exercise yes if you do that with reach all the way through and take it where it's slow and measured and move your body to it that's going to help get some um and then the other ones are um where you're hitting the different heights and you're either using something against it but slow and soft getting it to come out or just doing that yourself even where there's a movement in this part of you front and back all the way through where there's a, a this yeah you well your back. lion rolls the ball i love well, that yeah one. Because because it's, love that yeah one because it's yes. coming in the whole area yeah it's those right. kind of things such an underutilized simple move mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but you have to know how to do it correctly and it's kind of hard to teach <laughs> It, right. Yeah, there's a couple nuances to it. Once once you get it, it's it's like oh well, duh. But but there's there's a couple things that beginners always struggle with a little bit. The biggest one is I make sure that people know that this that that it's not just your arms. Yes. That this whole cavity here, exactly, mm -hmm. really should move. Like like you're really opening in it and closing it and moving through it and those kinds of things. And you don't want anywhere that goes or sticks or whatever. That's an area you're going to work on. You may even have to have it massaged at times to get it up to the point where you can build it up to using it like that. Once a week. Nice. Cool, oh, I man. envy you, Ty. Uh, <laughs> you what, you envy being old and having to recuperate? <laughs> when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a dedicated 
clear internal push hands class. And obviously right now you're, you're not, you did have one in California, correct? Yes, I did. Yeah. And then with your study group there, it'll be both uh, whatever form stuff and, um, and then your push hands. The, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm waiting to see how it develops. I'm actually hoping to get other people, like I have my push hands group from Sunday, trying to get them to come out and show some of their stuff because some of them are Chin people and Yang people. And so I'm really not, don't have it set in stone in my mind. It's like, I just want to bring people together and let's work on Tai Chi and without me having to be there every single yeah. time. Yeah. That's right. Cool. Um, okay. Um, what other modality, you have the Fogong Qigong certifications and you have that modality for, for that uh, Qigong work. Mm -hmm. What other modalities or healing modalities, that kind of thing, have you had training in or certification in? I don't have certification in it, but I do have training in Tuana. Oh. Yeah. Uh, was, that, was that mostly through Master Ho or do you have it other places too? Just through Master Ho. I didn't realize that he's considered a Tuana master. In, um, in China. When do you find that you're mostly practicing? Obviously in California, uh, the, qu the question that I'd asked you there would apply, would have applied, which was, did you have certain hours that you were like, this is what I'm doing, Fogong, um, healing Qigong. Um, for now, in like the groups that you're with there and that kind of thing, is there a, come and see me at this time or just, as needed or what's kind of going on with that? No, um, and this is something basically because of this group that I realized that um, I wasn't doing any Fagang for myself. It was okay, I will go ahead and do, do it one for you, yeah. Yeah, I'll do it for other people if they need it, but I wasn't doing it for myself. And so usually um, I have three training sessions a day for myself and by middle training session, which is when I do my knee gung, and also when I do my um, heavy weight work, that's also after that, uh, I do some standing work and I go ahead and, and do some fa gong work then. That's because I right now I've got a morning workout that goes any place from, starts at any place between 4.30 and 5.30 in the morning. Then I've got an afternoon workout around three. And then have our evening workout that starts at seven. So but. the other thing I'll recommend to you is that I do a fog on some fog on stuff before I go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. The trick is make sure it's not one that's going to wire you. Make sure it's one that's got the calming aspects to it. Right. But I head to toe and I try to set up uh, energy flow and alignment inside myself mm -hmm. so that when I go to bed, that the effects of that can go throughout the night. Oh, okay. Because right now I'm doing that too whenever I take a shower. That's part of my shower routine. Yeah, sure. Something I learned from you also. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I, do, I do it then as well. That's a, that's a certain aspect of the routine. But that one's a little bit, that one for me, it's a little bit more of an invigorating routine where I'm kind of ready to go after doing that. One <laughs> okay. night is much more of a sinking, relaxing, melting, making sure that the alignments are good making sure that I've got good energy flow everywhere, but not juicing me up as much as just that it's there and available and, and um, towards the rooting. It's, it's designed not to jack me up, otherwise I'm gonna sleep. Okay. Right? Which you don't anyway. Lots of energy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, So I'm going to ask you this and let you talk about it here, kind of like you have, and then we'll ask you other questions that pertain to it. So what are the top three most memorable Tai Chi moments in your life that you've seen or done or felt or experienced? Hmm. Um, one I've already talked about was the fact that you took the pain away from me um, and, and my hip. Another one it was it involved a a Wu Ho instructor who actually pushed me without touching me. And I'm like, oh, 
okay. It actually does <laughs> exist, yeah. Yeah, and um, I'm trying to think of some- Now, when you say he pushed you, well, are we talking the normal empty force, which is you'll just get some movement there, or was it like, blam, you know, this kind of a thing, which I- It was kind of, that. yeah, it's kind of halfway in between. Um, so it was strong, it was just, uh, yeah, not like, boom. Yes, and it was from a good, probably six feet away. Um, I had been gone through the formal introduction with him and had tea with him and I walked away to go get something. And as I'm walking past him, he, he zapped me, I'm like, huh. And then at one of your trainings and I, you commented on it is that I broke a board and I used no physical force myself. It's just like, almost like I just put my hand on the board and it broke. Yeah. Um, Whoa. <laughs> but yeah, those are like three of the major things that really stick out in my mind. Cool. I meant to ask you for your study group there that, that said some of them are Chinese and, and all of that and doing the different styles. Do any of them have a fog on method that they know? I don't know. I don't know them well enough. Um, they're all Chinese except for one. Yeah. And um, one was a William C.C. C. Chin student, the one who wasn't Chinese. And I've so not I've seen been, any Fagong from his people. Exactly. Uh, I've never seen any from his, pe from his people at all. So, and the other five, six, I don't know if they have anything yeah. of that nature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you mention it, um, you, it's the it's that extra fog where it's got that extra a. The yes. other funny thing is that if you said it, because it's a, it's is uh, it's is a little known as it is, and can and kept very secret and high level and all that stuff by the by most of the Chinese, they will probably assume you're saying something else. They'll like mishear you because there's no way you actually said that. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm warning you that ahead of time. So if they're giving you what go qigong you know like and give the idea of not touching and then they'll know what you're talking about whether they'll be able to whether they'll be willing to admit or not but if they know you got it most of the time they'll be forthcoming but if yeah. they think you don't have it and you're like oh i'm looking for this thing you know, they won't tell you nothing no what i find is that um if i mention it they'll say well who do you study with and if i mention the right chinese person <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, cool. 